to Sky Blue Symposia, a convivial gathering for stimulating conversation and a free interchange of ideas. Today, Neil Kramer has been kind enough to join us for a new symposium as we continue consciously exploring. I am Sabal, and I will be your host. Susan and Bridget will be joining our conversation. Neil and listeners, so glad you could join us. Susan will be asking the first question. Hi, Neil. This is Susan. Mysticism. You're a mystic. There's a lot of confusion about what that means. I wondered if you could tell us what it means, what it is, from your perspective. Sure. Well, hello. Hello to everybody and hello to the listeners. And yeah, let's get that one covered straight away because I often slip that word into my spoken and written dialogue. And sometimes one can be forgiven for presuming that everyone's aware of what that is. Particularly in a modern environment, in a modern lexicon, it's it's a funny word. I think from a, a dictionary point of view, the, the regular dictionary definition suggests that mysticism is an idea whereby there is some form of immediate contact or intuition with truths that transcend ordinary linear comprehension. You might say it's a very direct form of knowingness rather than the customary representational style of education. So it infers something spiritual and divine. I don't think there's any two, two ways about that. And a union with that spirituality or divinity. And for me, having presented on this topic just last month in Portland, mysticism sort of distinguishes itself from other areas of inquiry into the human and non-human and spiritual realms by virtue of its directness and its insistence on experience, right? Mm. So mm. I, I talked about this recently and said, you know, we have a lot of precedents and we have a lot of templates for mystical thinkers and mystical practitioners. And many of those people have had a big influence on society and culture and politics. And you can go long, long back into the historical record and talk about people like Heraclitus and Plato and Pythagoras and Zoroaster. And we could definitely say that those were mystical thinkers and practitioners. And then moving forward into medieval Europe, people like Roger Bacon, for example, who had a huge influence on society in the time, and John Dee and Edward Kelly and Nostradamus and Paracelsus, Sir Walter Raleigh, people like that. And even our scientific brethren, like Isaac Newton, was a major mystic. Most of his writing was of a mystical nature, but that was kind of squirreled away into other realms, and it obviously is known majorly for it mainly for his scientific studies, but he was a huge mystic in that he went his own way and realized that there was a material world and there was a non-material world and that the best way of making contact with that is to do it directly, not to theorize about it like a, a pure abstract philosopher, but to actually do it. And then we move forward to people like William Blake and Helena Blavatsky even the venerable Arthur Conan Doyle, one of my favorite writers, and controversial people like Grigory Rasputin and um, Alistair Crowley, Edward Waite, William Butler Yeats. You know, there's lots, there's lots of different ways of approaching that, but all of those people have one thing in common, which was that they realized that this link between science and philosophy and spirituality and magic and alchemy and all these lovely things could be considered as this thing that we call mysticism, which is always a little bit provocative and always, to some degree, and I would say in a healthy way, flies in the face of convention and says, look, if you're a conventional person and you have conservative values with, with a small c, then you're going to think this is a funny business, you're going to think this is a bit weird, and you're going to maybe rail against it a little bit. But actually if you deconstruct what that is and say rather it is a way that a human being says, right, I am going to decide for myself to explore the mysterious nature of the universe and I'm going to use whatever tools I can and I'm going to draw on our religious texts and practices. But I'm also going to hone that and I'm going to sharpen that with our philosophical and psychological disciplines because you can't just run off with a white robe into the mountains because that doesn't really do it. You know, you have to no. 
a little bit bring in these these other tools we have and you can't ignore science you can't ignore cause and effect and thermodynamics and the the basis of modern physics certainly in the last 200 years that they are part of life so is society so is culture so is the media so the mystic appreciates these things and says well let us take all those into account and let's do this personally and directly. So that is what the mystic is for me. Somebody who decides to explore the mysteries of existence personally and directly. That's wonderful explanation. I really appreciate it. And there's also a low and a high mysticism. And I think there's confusion about that. I think there's a lot of people practicing or, or more familiar with the low. I wonder if you could explain both of those. Well, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by high and low, but my thought about that is that you could see somebody in a robe, a black or a white or an orange or a yellow robe, who is in a little room somewhere Mm -hmm. doing things with potions and making spells and Mm -hmm. proclaiming things from other realms and stuff. And that could be characterized or stylized as a form of mysticism and say, well, this is the, the storybook Hollywood image of the mystic is a funny person, usually an older man with a beard, who is doing mystical things. It depends where you look in the historical record. A slightly higher view of that would be to look at some of the late 19th century mystics who were very serious men and women, very successful thinkers and writers who said, yeah, there is something fascinating going on here in the background that seems to be very primary and it's being ignored in the mainstream just as much in 1880 as it is in 2013. It's just the same situation and those people brought a beautiful degree of articulation and thought to these things. As I say, people like Blavatsky and people like Gurdjieff, although they were sometimes rascals, as Alan Watts described Gurdjieff once, Nevertheless, when you do away with some of the theatre that occasionally makes its way into mysticism, behind it is some very serious contemplation. And I think that it depends where you look and what historical time frame as as to how that's characterised. For me, the mystic is a sort of philosophical stuntman in that not too bothered about making mistakes and they're not overly concerned about peer review, as, as you might say, and people think of them and who sponsors them and who is, you know, who is funding their endeavours. The, the mystic is usually not swayed by that. They're not, they're not too bothered about that. And so it's always depicted as a rather solitary path and in a society that doesn't really like individualism, that really modern society promulgates the idea of of the collective over the individual. That's always a dangerous thing. And so one of the ways of dissuading people from the path of the mystic is to characterize it as something silly or dangerous. And those are very successful strategies. And of course, they get Sometimes they get a nice treatment, like Harry Potter's a you know positive mm. treatment to say, look, this might be okay. Or Lord of the Rings, look, this might be okay. This is a story of morals and principles and endeavor and discovery. You know, it might be okay. So some of our fiction is not bad. It introduces people to ideas where there is a positive view of these things. And I would say that if you look through the list of mystics that even something like Wikipedia might offer you will see a lot of very credible men and women who would define themselves quite happily as a mystic, a higher sort of mysticism where the level of discernment and the level of interface with normal mainstream society is there. They're not running away, as I I say, jokingly into the forest or the hills or the caves. They're saying, Mm no, I'm in society. I'm not ignoring what's going on. And let's see how mysticism and mystical practice actually plays a part in society and plays a part in human culture and indeed if you look at depictions of our chief mystic Jesus Christ he can often be seen wearing mystical robes wearing mystical regalia doing mudras hand signs that have mystical origins and it's a very personal pursuit and many of Christ's words wherever they derive from whether it's a man or a collection of men who who wrote about this can be very fairly considered as a direct path to divine ascendance. 
And so no, no matter which way you look at it, you will always see somebody like William Burroughs or Gustav Klimt even, and of course Carl Jung, who say, you know what, all this funny stuff, all this you know, mysterious, foggy, weird thing that goes on and these alchemists and these wizards, we can't ignore that. Some of the most astonishing perceptions that we've achieved as a human race come from those people. So brave pioneers in literature and physics and music and science will come forward and say, it's actually okay, this mysticism business. It might just be the word that makes us feel a bit funny, but it's okay. It's something that is deserving of our attention. Yes, and you mentioned dangerous, and in some ways it is, I feel, in that Mm. some part of the process is being deconstructed a bit and might interfere with who we think we are. Which yeah, that, leads me in. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was thinking in terms of stages of initiation. As we we go through that and prepare, we can't just jump to a high mysticism from a standing place at the start. Yeah, that's that's the big thing with mysticism, and it introduces the whole idea of degrees of initiation, not in the Masonic sense that we might jump to unconsciously, but in a, in any sense of initiation whether you were a, an amateur painter or a, a painter of repute or a master painter, you know, you go through stages of initiation in, in music and fencing and, you know, motorcycle riding. There are stages of initiation. There are things one has to do in order to prepare the mind and the body for the more adept levels of skill. And particularly in mystical practice, we shift the emphasis to the mental world to the world of the psyche the world of mind Mm -hmm. and that means that when you begin your initiation you start to transform and you start to transmute what it is to be a human being and the the fundamental alchemical principle of mysticism is that the further you go with it the closer you get to this sacred knowledge and this these secret things the more you leave behind the old idea of who you are. So rather than being Neil Kramer, you realize that you're not. And who you thought you were starts to change on a week-by-week basis. Now, if you've accepted that and you've explored that principle in a, a safe space with wise people, you're not bothered by that. You're not frightened by it. In fact, it can be rather exciting. And you think, well, wow, you know, that's that's mm-hmm. the usual. I, I am changing fast. I am transforming what I am on a, an ongoing basis, and that is a, a wonderful thing. On the other hand, the far greater majority of people would think, how terribly scary that thought is. What a weird thing. I don't want to lose me. I don't want to lose who I think I am. And if you define yourself by your stuff and your name and your house and family and job, and even by your very thoughts, if that's all that you define yourself by... When you feel those slipping away, you will stop at that point and think, no more. I will play with this thing on the edges, but I'm not going to step over that because I'm not ready to relinquish this sense of self. So that is the real initiatory test of the mystic to say, are you ready to stop being you? And Mm. until you can answer that with a hearty yes, then you're not ready. And so you do the study, you do the background work, you do the house cleaning, you get your mind supple and ready and gently introduce the brain to ideas that maybe you aren't who you thought you were, but it's a good thing. And in fact, it introduces you to the very real concept of transmigration, which is that this soul, this personage, isn't anchored here in the flesh, it's somewhere else. And you begin to develop the relationship with that thing. And actually, it brings a tremendous degree of self-confidence to think, I am indestructible. This whole thing (laughs) of the soul going on and on and on and actually having some divine element is true. It actually is true. And many of the secret elements of these mystery schools, these people who would study such matters, is all set up around that fact, that ultimate fact. And at higher degrees of initiation, that can be demonstrated. And that's why you have degrees of initiation, because until the mind is ready for that reality, it's very paradigm cracking. And it means that if you expose yourself to that knowledge too quickly, you won't be able to get up in the morning and brush your teeth. 
you will just be a neurotic, crazy, freaked out mess. Like anybody would be who was exposed to this enormous luminosity. You know, you do it by degree. You do it in phases. That is the way of it. Absolutely. You can't just jump from one into the other and that's a recipe for disaster. This is exactly why it's so important for us to have guides, I think, and people who can help us and show us along the way and also feel empowered by that sense of urgency and passion for what you're doing in it. You do. you You have to recognize that for all of us, there are people walking around this planet who know about these things and who appreciate the subtleties and the profundities of this stuff and are well positioned to guide us. And sometimes we find ourselves being that person ourselves. And at other times we humbly sit back and listen to someone else who knows a hell of a lot more than we do. And we just think, wow, you know, this is encouraging to realize that we're, though we're all at different stages, we can share this stuff together and it's okay. And it actually is a big part of what we're doing here, which is deconstructing the normal world of cause and effect and mainstream thinking and mainstream society and saying, well, that's okay. That has a place. But now I am graduating from that basic platform to look at something else you don't discard it you integrate that and say right i get that now i get the principles of that and now i'm going to move into something else and although essentially we can only do that on our own completely alone it isn't half helpful and it isn't half nice to do that with the guidance of other people when you understand that they are walking this same path that you are all at different levels you can never really know where someone else is but you can feel when someone is pointed in the same direction. You think, this guy, this woman is definitely doing the same thing that I am. They are transforming, they're growing, they have this enormous humility, but also this enormous self-love and self-respect. And when you put those two things together, you can drop your defenses, you can drop your guard and say, hey, look, you're doing this, aren't you? And they go, yeah, and you're doing it, that's right. And so you can share techniques and tips And you can share, this sounds a bit cheesy, but, you know, some of the sorrows of that sometimes to lighten the load and also some of the tremendous joys of it as well. And it is important for us to gather from time to time to do these very things. Sometimes we have to do it virtually as we're doing now, but Mm -hmm. it's also very important to make sure as far as is feasible in your life to do it face to face with people, to actually get with people in the physical and that is a mark of the mystic, that they find that they will build travel into their world as far as possible. Some of us have enormous responsibilities where that's very limited. Some of us don't. But you can always build some element of that, some kind of gathering, whether it's once or twice a year or once a week or whatever's right for you, to say it is definitely good for us artists to get together and exchange ideas on how we paint and how we see. And that's something of increasing importance because it tends to create a platform where you can reference things with other people who get what you're doing. If you try and do it with your friends and family who don't get it, it's very discouraging to say the least. You just think, why bother? Nobody gives a shit about this. They don't even understand what I'm doing. No, of course they don't because they're not doing it. You have to get with other people who are doing it, thinking about it and doing it. Absolutely. That rings so true, Neil. Thank you for that. I've been noticing recently there seems to be several different, call them ancestral heritages, re-emerging right now. Mysticism, certainly. I would describe another one as the path of love. Another could possibly be the re-emergence of the feminine in such a patriarchal dominated world. I'm wondering what your thoughts are about this. Do you think there are several lineages coming through, or do you think they're just all facets of the same diamond? I think they're all facets of the same thing. I, I think we can say they are ancestral heritages, and that, in a way, is a, is a means of us giving a lineage, uh, a sense of purpose to that, to say, yes, there are people who've been doing this, and there's a particular flavor of this where I can detect that there are other men and women doing exactly what I'm doing, who are focusing on, as you say, mysticism or love or deconstruction or alchemy or mm. creativity of some sort. And, and there are certainly, as you, as you meet people and as you speak to people, 
you can definitely detect different tribal resonances where people are saying, look, I am largely focused on music and dance as a means of embracing this mystical impulse, this human growth. That's, that's my method of doing it. And I look at those people and think, that's awesome. You know, that's absolutely amazing because we can all too readily discard the whole value of the body and of the creative arts and just see them as some sort of toy and just something that doesn't matter but those people create a bridge and say no the body is inextricably linked to this thing let us not drift into the cerebral realms which which we can all too readily do in this game let's let's understand that there's something very physical going on here with this as well and then you'll meet other people who are into very much the knowledge of it the information of it the mentation of it, the psychology of it. And they also provide a way into this thing. So I I see it that if you imagine there's like a circle and at the center point of this circle, there is this transcendent opportunity. There is this kind of stargate, if we can sex it up for a minute. There's a little stargate at the middle. And depending on what point on the circumference of that circle you stand and and view that center point, whether you're at 360 degrees or 270 or 180 or 90 or whatever, different points of that compass, as it were, provide a completely different view of what that transcendental opportunity is, of what that human impulse for growth is. And we could say that our human journey, the soul's journey over many lives, probably circumnavigates that thing and goes all the way around the circle and says, well, it surely would be a good thing to see every perspective on this, to be the artist and the lover and the warrior and the thinker and do all of those things and say, from each perspective, we can discern something unique and they all have something of tremendous value. And we must never think that the thinkers are somehow greater or that the dancers are somehow greater everybody has something to offer and all of it has value and you will naturally gravitate in one particular incarnation to people who have chosen the same compass bearing as you have you will do that and if we want to call that an ancestral heritage that's fine really though it's it's just a vector it's a vector of consciousness to say this is an angle to look at it from let's do that and you can go back And the ancestral word shows us that, yeah, you can go back in time and say there is a great tradition of people doing it through this particular medium. And we can learn from those people just as we can learn from people today. We can learn from people a thousand years ago, 10,000 years ago. So, yeah, I, I think that they are all fundamentally aspects of the same thing. There's no question about that. Knowing that we have gravitations to particular compass points where we're at at this present moment is natural. And it's a lovely thing to meet with those people, definitely. That is so exciting. And the image in my mind that you created is just so powerful. And I imagine all these energies coming together are reinforcing this thrust, which brings me to my next question. I heard you talk in your audio, Unfoldment Secrets in Sync, about spontaneous evolution. That sounds like it just happens, Or is it really that it happens because we're ready for it? And are we ready for it now? (laughs) Spontaneous evolution. (laughs) Yeah, I do too. I do too. I think that that is really an observation of mine that says when you have created a certain mental space where you've said, look, I've removed all the clutter here. I've taken all the objects out of this space and I've, I've relieved the mind from the weight of all these concepts that I've been holding and all these funny beliefs that really I didn't need. I thought I did at one time. There's nothing wrong with that. But now I've realized in the end, I don't need them. And you create a space, as it were, for things to happen. And when you do that, without knowing what it is that's going to happen and how things are going to evolve, things just spontaneously occur. Meetings arise. Projects arise. We congregate and collaborate on things or old problems will start to resolve themselves without necessarily the feeling that we've directed that. They just, it just starts to happen. So that spontaneous evolution is always kind of waiting at the door to come in and greet us and say wonderful things and show us wonderful things. And all we have to do is create the space to, to be able to open that door and say, yeah, come in. You know, And with this space, I can now commune with you and understand you and hear you and put that into some sort of context. 
So it's rather like creating en enough space in the course of a day for something to happen. You turn your telephone off, you close the computer, you tell everybody that you're, you're going off on a, a little trip somewhere and you'll be back later that evening. And, and off you go on the day with no agenda, no schedule, with no plan whatsoever, but you create the space for something to arise that is perfectly suited for a revelation or for an epiphany. A little one, a medium-sized one, a big one, it doesn't matter. Some sort of realization, some sort of observation, even just a witnessing of something is enough. And when you create that space, the universe has an uncanny habit of saying, right, this guy has created a space where I can now show them something. I can now reveal something that is custom made for their development and for where they're at. But I can only do that when there's space to do it. If it's cluttered, if their mind and heart are cluttered and blocked and toxic and unhygienic, then I can show them the most incredible things and they are, they're not even going to notice it. They're not going to see it. They're not going to be, do, be able to do anything with it. So you have to make the time and the space and the energetic setup that is appropriate to receive that signal, essentially. So that's what I'm talking about when I say spontaneous evolution. Yes, it does just happen, but you have to not just be ready for it, but you have to create the environment where you can actually observe it and detect it. That rings so true for me. And it isn't about trying or controlling. It is about just creating this opening, this space for allowing. It is. Um, and and the, the, perhaps the best way of describing it, I think I might have said this before, I try not to repeat myself, but it's a little bit like falling asleep. The more you try mm. to fall asleep, and God, God knows we've, we've all experienced this, the less it happens, right? Mm. So what do we do? We create a situation where falling asleep will occur. So you get comfortable, you get the temperature right, maybe you've exerted yourself and you're kind of tired. Everything's just right. You've dealt with all the things that you need to deal with in the day. You've put all your concerns aside. You say, well, I need to do this, I need to do it, but not for the moment. I'll, I'll come to those tomorrow. Right? For now, I'm not going to worry about anything. There's no value in that. For now, I'm going to enjoy sleep. I'm going to enjoy the mystery of dreams. I'm going to enjoy re-energizing my body. I'm going to enjoy rebooting the system. And I'm going to just let that happen and just smile into it and just not do anything, not try anything, not make any effort. And the less effort you make, the more it comes. <laughs> so well put. Thank you very much, Neil. Thank you, Neil. Our next section is with Bridget. Hi, Neil. This is Bridget. Hi. I wanted to ask you about a workshop where you mentioned Druidry and shamanism. And you said you'd been researching that because of your heritage. And it was kind of torturous because you said you'd been researching it, but you weren't going to go into it. And so I'd like you to go into that. Please. Yeah, that's the way of always making sure people return to your work, isn't it, really? Just to give them a juicy thing and then not, not let them have it. It wasn't, done <laughs> it wasn't done intentionally, I assure you. It's, you know, when you do a workshop, you have 10 things you're going to cover and they invariably touch on other subjects that might particularly stimulate certain people. Oh, yeah, I love that stuff. You know, I hope he talks about that or I hope this lady writes about that in her book or whatever it is. And then they don't, and you think, oh, my goodness me, don't, don't talk to me about bloody Christianity. I want to hear about the Druids, you know. But in talking about religion and the, the origins of some of the Christian texts, you will always touch on some of the old Celtic and Gaulish and Albionic stuff. And that leads to Druidry, Druidism, same terms for the same thing, and the shamanic principles I mean, shamanic really just in the sense that here is someone who moves between different worlds and who uses the chemicals and minerals of their environment to do so, right? That's all we mean by shamanism. And as you say, yes, in that Unfoldment Secrets and Sinks workshop, I touched on that. I mean, the Druids are one of the sort of oldest European set of magical practitioners that we are aware of, certainly that I'm aware of. There are other things as well that go further back, but we don't have any information at all. Even with the Druids, there is really no literature of any substance about them, which is, I think is fascinating and tells us something important just in that very fact. Within the formal historical records, we do know next to nothing about them, and that has to be owned up to. And As I've said before, if you get the sort of uh, two or three books that, historians have written about the druids and discard the pages that 
just discuss other things that were going on at the time, if you just look at the pages that are specifically about druids, there's about 10 pages in total in the world at this time about who they are and what they did. So we have to look to scraps of folk tales and fragments from uh, songs, believe it or not, and the surrounding mythology of the times, about 2,000, two, two and a half thousand years ago, and intelligently reconstruct matters from what was occurring in those, in those mediums. Now, it is said that there are secret documents that more fully describe what was going on, who these characters were and what they were doing and so on. But those documents are not in the public domain. And I might say that I have, I have seen one or two of them 10 years ago. And even those were sketchy. They required a lot of decoding to get what was really being said because these men of power and those times and what was happening then present a real problem to the modern historical sense of time and society. Because if you understand what the Druids were and what they were doing, it messes things up in a number of ways in terms of social structures and authority or lack thereof, magic, different kinds of interaction with physics, uh, radical inner technology. And so the Druids needed to be sidelined as fast as possible. So the Roman authorities who were holding the banner of the empire at that time, there's only one empire, but they were doing it at that time, they tried their best to erase the Druids from the historical record, which they largely succeeded in doing, it has to be said, sadly. And they used tried and tested method of smearing them with unpleasant stories of all kinds of things like human sacrifice and so on. And, and whilst there was definitely sacrifice going on at the time in, in Celtic lands, amongst other places, I cannot imagine a situation where that would be acceptable, desirable, or, or necessary for the enlightened, conscious practitioners of sacred earth magic and deep spiritual philosophy. It doesn't make sense. Even in modern times, the Russians and the Germans in, in the world wars would, would spread lies of human sacrifice and cannibalism to scare the wits out of each other. You know, there's many precedents for that. But the, the earliest formal note of the Druids comes from Greek texts about 500 BC or 300 BC or something. I can't remember off the top of my head. We don't have them anymore, those texts, but they were quoted by the historian Diogenes Laertius in the 2nd century AD. So that was a, a long time afterwards. And he indicates that the roots of philosophical inquiry, period, in that modern history, so it sounds old to us, but in that modern history, began among Celtic and Gaulish peoples with these guys called the Druids, which is quite an incredible thing to say, particularly for a, a, a Greek historian. And, and the Greeks noted that the Druids believed in metempsychosis, that is the transmigration of the soul from one lifespan to another, which during the Romanization of Europe in later years was a heretical concept that had to be immediately stamped out of the social consciousness. And yet there they were, and the, you, you hear whispers of it, even Emperor Caesar observed that their belief in the indestructible of the human soul uh, was real. And consequently the Druids had a total lack of fear of death, and they developed this superhuman courage, which was very annoying to the Romans at that time. And the Druids were known to be master astronomers, uh, master historians of ancient earth. They held records of ancient earth, which we know nothing about anymore. They were geographers, they were natural philosophers. And there are stories of them creating invisible force fields, of flying and illuminating dark places and all kinds of stuff. As we said earlier, they're very much the inspiration for the modern wizards of modern mythology, the Harry Potters and the Gandalfs and whatnot. Now, just... Thinking of, about your question, I'm looking at a different way of, of answering that. You, you mentioned plants, and presumably you, you're sort of talking about, when we say plant shamanism, you mean, um, you know, psychotropics, right? Not specifically, no. Just more the relationship that the Druids had with plants. And oh, okay, the, okay. The yeah. trees and stuff. Absolutely, okay, forgive me. Yeah, well, that's that's even better, because... As we say, we don't know an awful lot, but there are various things that we can observe and, and, and deduce. They did revere the oak tree, the power of the oak tree, and, and the plant that grew upon it, mistletoe in particular. And from sort of later pagan and Wiccan ceremonial practices, which I have knowledge about, they point to their origins also encompassing druidic use of mushrooms, which is a psychotropic element, but also 
as you say, things that have no relation to that, like Hawthorne and Hazel, and what we now call magic wands or staffs, for example, still invariably constructed from Hazel. And there are many curious little legends about this stuff, for example, and in, in European folklore, it is often observed that hazelnuts give one great wisdom. And there are tales of hazel trees that grew near ponds and rivers and some of the, the hazelnuts, the fruit of those trees, would fall into the, the ponds where they were eaten by fish. And especially with salmon in rivers, by counting the number of spots on a fish, you could figure out how many hazelnuts it had eaten, how much wisdom the fish had consumed, what resonance it had consumed from the hazel tree's own observations about the universe. So hazel could lead to tremendous knowledge, tremendous gnosis, and that's recounted in many mainstream folklore tales and fairy tales. The hazel branch, the Grimm's fairy, the, the tale of Fionn McCumhale, and you know all kinds of funny Celtic and modern Irish figures where we, we see traces of this stuff. So their view of the plant and chemical interactions and mineral interactions was, was very fundamentally alchemical. And they said that these beings, these entities, which we now regard as largely inanimate and do not possess any kind of uh, notable sentience, although that is changing now, more, more and more modern science is saying trees talk to each other and do stuff and communicate in a quite complicated manner uh, as I write briefly about in, in my book The Unfoldment you know if, if uh, one tree is getting attacked by insects it secretes a pheromone that can be picked up by the other trees that says hey I'm getting attacked and then all the other trees start mutating their sap so when the animals eat it they die and it's like a sort of chemical warfare you know there are many many stories of that we can say in modern science but that was just taken as read 2,000, 2,500 years ago. They said that these tree things, although they don't speak with mouths and see with eyes and hear with ears, they know things about the world that is of tremendous value to us. Now, they have no desire or inclination to come and speak at the human level, which is not necessarily higher at all. Instead, we need to go to their frequency on the spectrum, shall we say, we need to recalibrate our consciousness to say, if we want to understand a tree's experience of existence and what it has discerned about the way things occur on this planet and how it organizes consciousness, not as an individual and not as a collective, but in a completely different manner of speaking, very multidimensional, there are awesome things we can attain from that knowing, really, really fabulous things that we can do. But we have to learn how to bring our consciousness into that part of the spectrum. And that is a very sacred practice. And it's something that cannot be talked about. It can only be done. And we have neo-Druids who are attempting to rediscover that, some with success, some with comical lack of success but that doesn't matter they're trying and when people try and fall over we must never laugh at them because some people never try so trying is better than not trying even if you don't succeed because with every little failure you learn something and you think well it isn't really a failure it was just a, a branch on the tree if you forgive the pun that you know ended and then we go back to the root and try another branch and that's the purpose of this thing that's the mystical element to say if you want to liaise with plant consciousness, it's certainly a lot easier to do if you use a psychotropic plant like the psilocybin mushroom, for example. But you don't have to. You can do it in a more direct way, even, by just changing your consciousness from your own will, from within yourself. And sometimes, it has to be said, and I agree with um, our old friend Terence McKenna on this, that you can certainly learn a lot by communing with the you know, dimethyl tryptamine, the tryptamine elements of plants to say, well, here, let me give you a helping hand. Let me just pause what you're doing for a moment with your human consciousness and show you the way we do things. Let's do that for a minute. But once more, as we said earlier, if you've not created the space to do that and to experience that properly, you will just come back with a funny tale of a freak out weird thing with all kinds of odd montage images of human society and you'll try and anthropomorphize everything but if you create the space you get a clearer view of how that part of the ecosystem is doing things because it's very much 
holistic nature as we know. It's not necessarily definable into a tree, a plant, soil, mushroom, rock, you know, eagle, snail. You know, they don't differentiate in quite the way that we do. So if you take one little part of that ecology and you choose the part that has a chemical that bridges one conscious level to another, then you can momentarily take part in that ecological vision of consciousness that is non-human. And that is typically done with psychotropic plants like the mushrooms and the cacti and the vines. And depending on where you are, you know, you're doing your Banisteriopsis carpi in the jungle and you're doing your cacti in the desert and you're doing your mushrooms in the temperate climates of Europe or whatever. And you choose what is there. And that's the value of it being ecologically geographically local to where you are so if you go to the jungle and do ayahuasca great but that might not be hugely relevant to your life back in seattle in washington state you know so you might want to look at what's around there what's being done on the islands off in the pacific northwest just right near where you live and what are some of the traditions there there's always things to learn there's nothing wrong with going and tasting the exotic flavors of consciousness in other realms but know your own local realm as well. Know your own community about where you are now. That has great value. Thank you. That was fabulous information. We are pausing this symposium to give our guest an opportunity to inform you about his activities and how you can learn more about him. Neil, could you tell us a little bit about where our listeners can find you and what events are going on? Sure. Well, it's very straightforward. If you go to neilkramer.com, and that's Kramer with a K, uh, everything is really there. There's also other interviews, other writings, other information about the teaching and coaching work that I do, information about forthcoming events. As they arise, they will appear there. And if people really like what I'm doing, they can feel free to indulge in my merchandise of downloads and books and dvds and so on so there's plenty of stuff there neilkramer.com thank you and i can recommend his book the unfoldment as well we'll now return to the symposium with neil susan and bridge our next topic is about the universe my question is about how do we operate with the universe you can try and be a planner and try and manage your life you can be passive and let the universe manage your life and bring, you know, whatever comes, or you can be in partnership and kind of try and co-create life. And just in talking about this with a friend of mine, we were noticing that day-to-day -day planning was working like lunch dates, but larger outcomes weren't working as well when we held too tight on the reins. How do you suggest that we find a happy medium and partnership with the universe? Yeah, that's a fascinating thing to consider all that. That's a, such a great question. I think it's instructive to observe how those who lean too heavily either way end up in trouble, right? So those who try to plan and control everything in life, and we all do that a little bit, but I'm sure we all know someone who does that a lot. Or you mm -hmm. can see someone at work or in the family or even on television. People we know who do that, they end up in all kinds of trouble, when they try and control everything, they have nervous breakdowns and suffer terrible depressions and all kinds of nasty things. And equally, those who try to let everything just be part of the flow, they find themselves in all kinds of scrapes and negative situations with their finances and relationships and wild mood swings. And in eschewing any sort of mental discipline, they too become unhappy. So both those paths of swinging to the extreme of trying to manage things and then just letting go and letting the universe do what it was, when taken to the extreme, lead to imbalance. So the real answer to the, to the question is, how do we find a happy medium? And I like your word of partnership with the universe. The real answer to that is, in my view, is you live your life as a human being and you continue to do so until you achieve a natural balance through the ups and downs of your own life, through your own endeavors. So that's the real answer to that, but we, we certainly do find, as you might say, wise, conscious maneuvers that we can use to strike a balance to get that stuff in closer alignment with our will, to speak to other people and say, how do you keep balance? What do you do? For example, if we are puzzling over something that doesn't immediately offer up an answer, so if we're thinking of moving house, 
where do we want to move to or a new creative project or we're trying to name something which is always an interesting exercise or what should what should we do you know in regard to any matter if we're thinking about that and the answer doesn't arise you just think I just don't know I'm just not sure if that answer refuses to immediately surface then it's a good idea to put it in the mental slow cooker right Mm -hmm. and leave it for a few hours or even a few days or even longer and more often than not when we return to that matter some magical alchemy has taken place just like it does with cooking and we have our solution we have the desired result we have the correct result should we say now that might not have been possible earlier for all kinds of complex reasons to do with the environment, mental state, levels of focus and and whatnot. So what we're doing when we consciously slow cook something, throw it in the slow cooker, is to reconfigure consciousness for a better setup for the question and answer, more appropriately set up for that, just like being in the right frame of mind to play music or to laugh with friends around the dinner table or go for a happy walk you know we don't always feel like doing those things if we're in certain introspective or contemplative states of mind so we choose our moment and then you choose the moment for having dinner with your friends and it's just right and it's wonderful and it's great and it's awesome and that is the principle for me the wisdom of planning and flow essentially what is happening is that we are learning to superimpose one over the other. So we plan alongside the flow. We plan with the flow at the same time. We do both things at once. And all the while, to kind of maximize the effectiveness of that, we observe flow. We observe human mental planning and begin to appreciate and begin to learn about the interplay between the two things in a deeper way. Just like any creative project, we need a mix of the two. And and dare we say, the supreme god entity that made this whole place probably was doing the same thing. Having a precise and overarching architecture, but also leaving some of the articulations and textures to creative, spontaneous flow, allowing other sentient beings to participate in that and have their say. So the more conscious, balanced and wise those beings are, the bigger the say they have in the unfoldment of creation. And it is, I feel, very much an ongoing enterprise that. It's an unfinished business. It's a work in progress. And it's fascinating. And if we can only just rise above our immediate concerns and worries and so on, we can then properly begin to appreciate the the underlying wonder of it all. So that's part of the human journey. It's perhaps one of the most essential elements to say, how do we find this balance between flow and planning and the answer is you live your life you do your life and you do it as consciously as you can and by doing your life and by allowing the universe to also do your life because it is a partnership you start to find that balance again as we said earlier without trying to some extent so being conscious of something doesn't necessarily mean you you know churn the computer gears and really really analyze and ruminate and cogitate it sometimes means well now i am conscious of it i can create a space to say okay new line of code seek balance in every endeavor find the sweet spot just like if you're in a if you meet somebody that you that you love spending time with you don't want to just talk interminably all the time and just chatter 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 and they don't get a bloody word in you know that's not much fun for the other person so if you really enjoy being with somebody you strike a balance don't you between saying things to them and then listening to them and then spontaneously allowing new things that you hadn't considered at all to arise in the conversation and you're looking for a flow 60 40 40 60 50 you're looking for a flow of conversation and it's it's just the same as that you look for that sweet spot of balance where you go away from that meeting with that ace person i think that was that was awesome and they go away and think yeah that was awesome because we listened we learned we talked we laughed we talked about things of substance we talked about silly things that were equally entertaining and there was a flow and that we struck the balance in that conversation and so you can take a little thing like that that we all do and just zoom out, macro that out from the little situation to the big situation and think, 
Well, it's all rather like that. It's all rather a creative thing that just kind of happens. And you consciously try and find the center point, the sweet spot all the time in whatever you're doing. So that's my view of, of that whole dynamic. Wow. As you were speaking, this image came to my mind of rafting down a river. And you can try and raft up river, which is fairly difficult and doesn't get you anywhere. <laughs> you can ignore what you're doing and end up drifting into a swamp. And then in a river, there's the sweet spot. With just a few little paddles, you can stay in the sweet spot in the middle where the flow just goes. That is a great image. That's a perfect way of describing it. It's exactly like that. There's the flow and there's how you ride that flow, how you surf that flow, how long you decide how long you're going to be in that river, how fast you want to go and how slow you want to go. You have some say in that. And yet there is the flow. And so the art of it is to say, rather than create the river as an adversary in our minds, let's see it instead as a partnership because it actually is. The river is as conscious of us as we are of it, literally speaking as well in that, in that case. And having rafted in, uh, on the White Salmon River last year over here in uh, Washington State in Oregon, um, I can attest to that because when you do create an adversary of the river, guess what? It turns you upside down. <laughs> <laughs> That'll learn you, right? <laughs> yeah, that was a fast learning exercise for me. And then when you learn to go with it and you see these old-time kayakers and rafters and canoers and whatnot, and you see what they're doing, they're much more fluid and slow and curves of their movement. There's no angles. It's all curves. And they are becoming, with this energy, they're becoming part of the environment. And I know that sounds a little cheesy again, but it really is true. And as you start to build that into it, your movements begin to inform themselves and you start to accelerate your learning process. There's no substitute for time and experience, but you can get into the, the vibe of the thing and say, ah, right, it really is a state of mind, this thing, isn't it? And they have the sort of qualified, skillful rafters. They have learned to find that balance in this particular part of, of life. And I suggest that in, in everything that we do, everything, it's the same principle. Ah, thank you. And Bridget has the next question. Yeah. Could you tell us more about what you know about the sun? You mentioned several times in your workshop the sun downloading information to us. And I'd like you to elaborate on that, please. Sure. Goodness me. The sun is one of those symbols that recurrently arises in mystical study, particularly in Rosicrucianism and theosophy, actually, you will see this symbol presented repeatedly in a number of different ways. More enigmatically, I would say as well, the more one progresses through the knowledge of these systems of thinking, of these suggested pathways of thought. At root, my answer to that really is at root, in a universe that is built on energetic exchange, and everything that occurs is the exchange of one might say, two little waveforms of energy wiggling around together, and that's what we call life. The sun represents the most powerful source of that in our immediate environment, in our immediate system. And just from an astronomical point of view and a straight physics point of view, the sun is the source of it all. The sun is absolutely critical to all, all life and all uh, mineral and chemical exchange. There's no question about that. And it did seem to me a little strange when I started my mystical study that you had these people a long time ago who were sun worshippers, solar cultists, right? And you have this image in your head which is bolstered by admittedly mainstream fictional narratives of these people in exotic clothes bowing down and throwing themselves on the floor and worshipping this big orange yellow fireball thing in the sky and you think how silly how silly is that it's just the sun get over it let's let's look at more serious matters let's consider creation in a more articulate and eloquent manner get off the floor you fool right and that has been totally overturned in my mind now to the extent where i'm slightly embarrassed that i ever thought that the sun is very much worthy of everybody's study, I might add, and presents some of the most sacred and secret teachings that there are, period. In Rosicrucianism, as I say, 
you will see that this symbol keeps surfacing, keeps coming back. And there are talk of the sun outside and the inner sun, the hidden sun, the sun in the sky, all these different things. Other uh, more modern interpretations will relate the sun as a kind of initiatory phase in itself. And there is suggestion, and this isn't really the place to go into it, but there is the suggestion that one comes in through the sun and one goes out through the sun. And we'll leave it at that, if you don't mind my saying, because the principles of this require such a very delicate and special mental space to set up that we can't really do that in this environment. So there's a reason why these things are discussed in certain spaces and at certain times. But the principle of it is out there. And even the first stages of real comprehension about what that thing is, that knowledge is out there in the public domain, sometimes on the shelves in libraries, and sometimes we have to go and see people like me blabber about these things. And hell knows there's people who do a better job of it than I do. But solar activity, even on the physical level, has become more prevalent in the mainstream conspiracy circles and, you know, talk of coronal mass ejections and going off the grid and this intimate relationship between the earth and the sun is being ever increasingly sort of articulated by modern science. I saw something, I wish I'd kept it now, just last week where they were saying that the the magnetic relationship between the earth and the sun is far more intimate than that branch of science had ever previously admitted to itself. And it's only now starting to say, goodness me, that thing might be 97 million miles away, but the connections to the earth are absolutely intimate, absolutely right there in your face. And every interaction that takes place here is very, very closely bound to that thing. And I would suggest that in people's study of that, it is worth contemplating what it is? What is it? What is that thing in the sky that appears to shine down, that radiates? And as you begin to inquire about that, particularly in my chosen framework of mysticism, you, you hear talk of these, this, the seven rays and these, the inner sun and the relationship between godly beings and stars, suns, suns for those who don't know are stars, in Druidic law, and this is admittedly through accounts of druids from other people, uh, you could collect that stuff in certain minerals, and they were very directly equating light with information. And modern thinkers, all of the names escape me, and I'm not, <laughs> I can't think who, but perhaps Robert Anton Wilson or Terence McKenna, I can't quite bring to mind, but modern sort of countercultural figures who were, you know, involved in psychedelics and so on, but also were very articulate philosophers in their own right, have also come to that, to the study of that relationship and said, thinking about what light is starts to shine a light, <laughs> as it were, on that whole subject, because it isn't just the, what we think it is, it's just like some sort of heat or it's some photon thing. There's, there's more to it than that. And indeed, when you go back to these texts and they talk about the, the light of this and the inner spark of that and the holy sun and all these things, you start to just get a moment where you sit back and think, are they, are they being very, very literal here, actually? Are they speaking less figuratively than we have supposed previously? Are they, in fact, telling us something that's so massive, so in your face, that we, we can't quite conceive of it? And I think that the answer to that is yes. And when you begin that study, it leads to all kinds of fascinating places. So it really is one of those things where the value of it is only truly arrived at by going there yourself. Neil, I'd like to ask you a little bit more about this. Do you think that the sun is a conscious being in and of itself and is it also connected to other parts of the galaxy and even the universe yes it is conscious <laughs> yes, I think. yes 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 <laughs> I'd, I'd say no to that in any way shape or form and much more literally than certainly i had previously thought as i say i don't quite see it in a simple manner of saying it, it is an entity mm. 
as a discrete separate entity, as we might say, there is a person and they walk into the room and they are a discrete entity. Uh, less less so than that, it is in the book I kind I describe a point where different intelligences intelligences and levels of individuation come together as a consonance. And you say where you achieve a certain level of multidimensionality, that is where you can be in several places doing several things at the same time, all together simultaneously. This is a consonance. And I think the sun is a supreme form of consonance of what we might say spiritual intelligence, which is intimately linked to all spiritual intelligence. That is all transcendental life from source on the planet. And indeed, dare I say, and this is a whole can of worms, and on all the other planets in our solar system as well, not carbon-based life, different kind of life. So we are walking lumps of coal, really, aren't we? A lump of coal, and we have a graphite, and we have diamonds, and human beings. It's all the same thing. So the mode or format of sentience is, I would say, arbitrary, or certainly related specifically to where that happens to be and in some mystical schools and again you can read this openly in books mm-hmm. on the shelves they will say yeah you proceed through the solar system at various stages of development and various refinements of consciousness and the carbon consciousness the one we have at the moment which we call human is a very specific way of learning. It's a very specific semester in the mm. Cox University. And it says, right, be carbon-based consciousness and see, see what that's like. Learn from that, go through that school, and then you will move on. So we, we have, of course, like Mercury and Venus and Earth and Mars and Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune and all these planets, and they have a very distinct relationship to one another. But it really is moving into very, very esoteric realms when you start to suggest that it isn't just this accidental game of pool where all these lumps of rock just found themselves throwing their mass in orbit around this giant nuclear reactor. There's something very, very precise going on, and it it happens very, very specifically for very specific reasons. And even for the most flexible-minded, those with really impressive levels of conscious plasticity, you will be challenged when you read some of the more initiated levels of information to say that that sun is actually very specifically related to your personal life as you in a very, very, very important and profound way. And not only that, but when you zoom out from that picture that all of the suns, all of the stars are doing that and that Hmm. the network of life is so staggering you can barely Mm -hmm. think of it you can barely imagine it i said recently it's rather like the spider sat in the corner of the room wondering about how the federal reserve works yeah really in a position to have any information to have the mental capacity or any relevance to that right now and yet it's free to wonder if it wishes to do so just as we are so the the other part of the question you know how do these relate to larger universal and galactic themes we can't know that we can barely know what's going on right here and right now and i yeah. would suggest that it's a natural human um impulse to try and figure out what is the manner in which these things work? How, what is the framework? What is the big blueprint in the background? The answer is you will come to that. You will see that. But let me suggest very strongly that nobody who walks on this earth knows that by design. As I say in the book, the whole point of coming in blank and not knowing anything is to ensure the veracity and the solidity of your own experience on earth. It's somehow impeded and very much diminished if you come in knowing that you were from this system and you're doing this and you're on a big sacred journey with all these exciting contracts with other souls. The reason we don't know that, and you know what I mean when I say that, we can think of it, yes. and imagine, but the reason we don't know it is because our the value of our knowledge as momentarily discrete separate individuals is increased by coming in blank and not knowing anything so i would say for the, all those people who think how does this whole thing work what's the point of it what's the purpose of it why here why me why now the answer will 
reveal itself without you doing anything, right? You don't have mm. to pursue that answer. It is always pursuing you. All you've got to do is get out of the way and allow it to present itself. Well, maybe it's enough to just be open to possibilities and to begin to ask questions like that, not it expect that's, any answers. That's right. It's it, Asking questions, in a way, is more important than receiving the answers because it starts to point your consciousness in a certain direction. And we must always ask questions. And our curiosity and inherent inquisitiveness is a, a very wonderful facet of the human makeup, I would say. And I think it's, it's always a, a delight to see that propagate itself throughout our years so it doesn't just finish like sadly it does with so many people in our 20s it goes on and when you're 45 and when you're 65 and when you're 85 you're still doing it you're still thinking yeah yeah what next what wow wow let's look <laughs> exactly time to do everything oh my god i'm going to be dead soon it's like yeah but don't worry about it because the journey goes on and yeah. you can have a knowingness of that if you do the right things and if you adopt certain practices and if people show you certain techniques, you can take the weight off that. And, you know, we, we can't deny that death is always going to come as somewhat of a surprise to us in the moment it arrives. And you think, oh, my God, this is it. There we go. You know, now we'll know. Now we'll get a few answers. And that moment, and, you know, God willing, it's always a moment of peace and painlessness and surrounded by some element of love. In that moment, we're always going to be tested in that how that transition actually occurs. And part of life and part of positioning consciousness is about that. Say, ready yourself for the exit point, right? So just as you would ready yourself to step off the aeroplane when you've arrived at your destination and you've got a bag with certain things in it and you've got certain tools and items and clothes and maybe some books and maybe some knowledge in your head and you've got equipment for a new journey and that is very much the case with this in that if your life is spent equipping yourself for the transition point that's quite a nice way to spend your time so thinking mystically and thinking philosophically and being aware of the value of what we call religion and the origins of that and how it's gone wrong and how certain human beings are behaving very stupidly is all tremendous training really awesome, superb information and practice and exercises of, of, of great value to say when you exit, which is guaranteed, you will put yourself in a good position the more aware of your own self and your own life you have become. If you hide away from it, you can virtually guarantee that at the exit there will be this helter-skelter right back to where you started again. And it wasn't wasted, nothing is ever wasted, but you will guarantee your return ticket to almost the same predicament. New mm. faces, new clothes, but the same dynamic, the same yeah. last ones that you tried to hide away from, they will hunt you down and there's no <laughs> way of escaping them. So rather than play this game of the prey and the hunter, take control of the whole thing. Mentally take control of the whole thing and say, right, I'm going to use this as an opportunity to grasp the learning and the value of this university and this place. And I'm going to appreciate the dynamics of this as set up for me personally, not mm. some weird political distance, spiritual oddness. You personally are being afforded this opportunity. And once you see it as that, you can then start to use all the resources that are here rather than make opponents of them. Very wise words, Neil. Very wise. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. So we're going to go on to our next topic of challenges, and Susan has the next question. I'm going to quote you, Neil. I heard you say, I want to enter this assault course called life to get my soul into tip-top condition. What are these top challenges we're to overcome? And you had also said these challenges are preparing us for our next mission. Does that kind of connect to what you were just saying? Yes. Yeah, very much so. And if you would say a simple thing like this, that understanding the dynamics of polarity is the most obvious in-your-face lesson for any awakened mind on Earth. 
to see what that is and how it works. Polarity is so clearly something that we are day by day offered up as a puzzle to say, here you go. Here are things that are black and white. Here is one pole of great bliss. And here is another pole on the same line of tremendous sorrow, of deep, bottomless anguish. And there they are. And you cannot get rid of them while you are here. Some people Mm -hmm. think as they go on the spiritual journey, those things somehow magically start to dissolve. They don't. They don't go away while you're here. They are there for a reason. And so one of the most clear exercises that is put on your desk, so to speak, in this in this life is to say, polarity, what's all that about? Discuss. <laughs> right? <laughs> oh, yes. Oh my God, right. Okay, well that's a big one. Because philosophically we can certainly think of all the good and evil things that occur in this world, as you might say, and think, why the hell does that have to be the way it is? Why on earth do we have to go through all that? And then in your own life, you think, yeah, I've had a great day today, and the next day is terrible. and doesn't seem mm-hmm. to have a lot of rhyme and reason to it. One day you feel full of energy, full of creative passion, and full of juice and tremendous optimism and all the rest of it. And the next day you just feel flat as a pancake, and you just think, well... I think I'll just have some M&Ms and watch uh, The Joy of Painting with Bob Ross instead. I think that might be a good thing to do, right? And you just zone out and off you go on a little journey of self-indulgent escapism. Everybody does that. Me, you, everyone listening. We all do that. We all do that. And so that is another level of polarity that is dished up every day for us to say, you know, some days you feel okay and some days you don't. That is another emotional polarity that is put forth So it's there all the time to observe the dynamics of this and try and understand what that is. Well, that kind of leads on to my next question. There's this little matter of evil. You called it the obedient servant of good, just different roles. I think that evil, at least in my own experience, has been the catapult to push me to grow. Is that what it's about from your perspective? It's a very, very profound question the whole good and evil thing some people who have a a problem with my material don't like the idea that i do away with evil right (laughs) they think that that is unacceptable and that there are clearly evil things in the world and given certain lens through which to look if i was constrained by their lens it it, is hard to argue with that right It makes things a hell of a lot easier when there is pure goodness and pure evil, right? If that was the case, it's all very, very simple, this, because you simply go out and you get rid of evil. You destroy it completely until every last scrap of it has been obliterated from the universe. Great job done. Now let's enjoy ourselves. If that was the case, I would tool up with the most awesome destructive power that I could possibly muster and go out as like badass stormtrooper that I am and go out and destroy all evil wherever I I came across it, right? Now, as anybody with two brain cells to rub together will immediately be thinking, isn't that all rather dependent on what you consider evil and who is arbitrating what that is? What is evil to me might not be evil to you. And what is evil to uh, a Muslim might not be evil to a Christian and vice versa. And you get all these terrible problems in the world because of people arguing about that very thing. One way of beginning to resolve that extreme of polarity is to say, well, let's create a world where there is the potential for too much creation Mm -hmm. and all the potential for too much destruction. And if you start to equate goodness with creation and evil with destruction, you you begin to get a clearer view and you begin to diffuse the emotional weight of the word good and the word evil and say, well, let's consider them for the moment instead of good and evil as creation and destruction, right? If there was a world which was completely weighted towards destruction, and all that really ever occurred were things were destroyed, then that world, in the, in the same manner as a virus that destroys its host, would soon peter out. It would soon yeah. fizzle out of existence altogether because there's nothing left to destroy. So it's like the evil tyrant has become so incredibly powerful that he's just sat on this 
blank black sphere of a planet thinking, well, that's it. I've done it. I've destroyed everything. I've destroyed everyone. I have total power and I've won. The only problem is there's nothing to have power over and there's no no way to enjoy my win. And I am just sat here on my own on this black ebony throne just twiddling my thumbs. It's, Mm -hmm. It's not much of a game when the creative element has been entirely removed from the game board, right? Yeah. So think of it the other way. This is very important, particularly for us who have occasional new age impulses, which must always be stamped out as quickly as possible. In a world of radically less polarity of destruction, let's say, a world of, of, uh, of golden meadows and, and gorgeous elven temples with people just languishing in poetry and beautiful watercolours and, and all the rest of it, is that a place where there's going to be a, a tremendous vision for learning and a place for tremendous driving forth of consciousness? Or is it really just a place of repose? Is it really a vacation? So having too much creation, and there are fictional narratives that explore this when utopias go bad. What happens when a utopia, people get bored, right? People get fed up and think, well, no one ever gets ill. No one ever dies. Everybody's super nice to everyone else there's no diseases we're just all fantastic musicians and painters and love makers and actors and actresses and everything is just horribly wonderful all the time right so in that world you've got a problem as well in that although it's wonderful there isn't any movement there isn't any growth okay sounds Think- like a, a place of big fat babies that never grow up It does indeed, which we could say various real-life locations that mimic that, but we won't do that for people who live there. No. Right? (laughs) Yes. So we say instead that that is a problem, and a lot of uh, New Age visions of utopia, let's all hold hands under the rainbow and love one another. If you take that to its ultimate destination, you you wind up with a big problem that things stagnate, right? Mm -hmm. And so you start to say, okay... If there's too much creation, things slow down. And if there's too much destruction, things slow down. If there's total creation or total destruction, things stop altogether. So you start to think, okay, so these things of positive and negative could be more accurately regarded as the plus on, and a minus on a Duracell battery, right? The minus on your battery isn't evil, is it? This charges charge or it moves charge in a certain pattern. And the positive, we could say, figuratively speaking, emanates charge and distributes mm-hmm. a certain pattern. And the interplay of those two things, if you look at diagrams of magnets, you'll see this interplay of the forces as they bend round in this kind of toroid across each other. That is the, as you might say, interference pattern of the two. That is the magnetic play of what those fields do. And at a very top level, and this is very abstract for a moment, but that's what this is. It's the interplay of those two fields. And the reason for it, we can deduce, we might be wrong, but my best deduction is this, is to show you the effects of consciousness in the material world by sucking it down to such a degree that for a moment you suppose that there is an ultimate evil and there is an ultimate good, when really there isn't. But in order to slow that down in a temporal space, you have to play the game. It will all be wonderful and it might all be horrible. And neither of those two things, are strictly speaking, are true because that is a determination that only the individual makes, only the divine source makes, you might say. So I think that you can never truly collapse polarity while you are here, right? Yeah. We said before about flow. What you can do is observe the dynamics of that polarity and accept for a moment, you don't have to, but entertain the idea that that polarity is a very critical component of the teaching mechanism to say, in this world, one of the foundational laws is polarity. In the 3D, you'll come out of it soon enough. But while you're here, there's this polarity of black and white, Mm -hmm. Or creation, destruction, happiness, sadness, pain, pleasure, all those things that we all understand. And they exist to compel you to seek balance, to move forward, 
and to observe your dynamic of how consciousness, how your personal experience of consciousness affects those things, right? And so you can never stand still in such a world. And so if nothing else, the very most sort of bottom line interpretation of that would be to say polarity and negative, polarity of positive and negative compel movement, a movement forward or a movement backward. There is no standing still in a polarized world. So a polarized world is you live at the boot camp every morning at 5.30 a.m., this guy comes in and shouts and wakes you up from your dormitory crappy little <laughs> bed and you have to run outside and do press-ups and star jumps and goodness knows what. That's polarity. It's saying, look, I know this kind of sucks a little bit, but it's temporary. While you're here, polarity means you have to move. You have to move and your only choice is do you want to go forward or backward? You're free to do whatever you want. But you cannot stand still in a temporal zone where polarity is the underlying dynamic. Wonderful. Here's another question about you. What are your thoughts about our shadow being our ally? Is it possible that hidden within that lies a deeper truth or path? For instance, if one explores, say, alcoholism. Mm Mm-hmm that that might reveal that someone is searching for a spiritual a spiritual path if if it's explored and i just wondered if that's the case or if i'm misreading it that there there is something in our shadow that's screaming at us to pay attention you're very wise if i may say to move to a very pragmatic issue or a very pragmatic approach that we can relate to, right? It's because everybody's known mm. some who's had a problem with alcohol or drugs or uh, there's been some violence perpetrated or received or some abuse or whatever. When you bring it into the home, right, and you've got, let's, let's look at the typical situation where there's a father who drinks all day, comes home and beats everybody up, the kids and the mother, and then the mother's working two jobs and all the money that she earns, he just spends on booze and then just keeps beating them up. If mm. you are that, hopefully not in your own life, but if you can appreciate the principles of that, it's very difficult to think philosophically about that and to say, is this man on a spiritual path? <laughs> right? It doesn't mm-hmm. look very spiritual when he's beating someone around the face and supposedly innocent beings are being subjected to unnecessary torment, right? So you have to understand that there are numerous perspectives and numerous multiple positions of consciousness that all are relevant and true. So it is true that it would be better if he wasn't doing that. And it is true that it would be better if he resolved that problem and that that family lived happily together and loved one another and behaved in a civil and excellent manner, right? That's true. Correct. And there's no denying that. So we're not letting anybody off by acknowledging no. this path. We're saying Never. you are behaving in a very poor manner and you are conducting yourself in essentially an un- unacceptable fashion. And that will stop. You will either be locked up, you will kill everybody, you will kill yourself. That will stop, right? Mm-hmm. But the excellent is if you saw the principle of the thing that lies behind the coarse nature of its expression, which is being abusive to yourself and other people, right? Mm -hmm. Say if we apply this to what we were saying earlier, it's not evil, but it's destructive. There's no question about that. It's destructive. So that person is choosing to explore the path of destruction. And there's no argument against that that I can see that makes any sense. So somebody who is doing such a thing in our little scenario that we that we're creating is exploring a path of destruction and because we live in a universe that will not allow stasis will not allow a stationary conscious being to stay in one place it will change it will mm-hmm. change the situation will change and ultimately although it may not be in a single lifespan which which makes it very difficult for some people to think about But entertain the idea that, let's say we have a thousand lives, right? And the alcoholic dude who's being a bastard to everybody is on one of the first run of those lives. He's on life 12, right? 
and he stopped murdering people. <laughs> but yeah. he's still being a, a son of a bitch, you know? Right. On his, on his 13th life or whatever, he'll come back and think, yeah, I'm not going to do that. I have an mm-hmm. impulse to do that, and I have a knowingness. And I don't know where and how and why and what, but because I've come in blank. But I have a knowingness yeah. really, really far inside that it's very, very important, above all else, to behave in a civil uh, conscious, supportive, and encouraging fashion with my family and to love them unconditionally. And then that is a permanent upgrade in that soul adventure, mm. soul mm. cycle, right? And off that guy goes and never, ever does it again, right? So in order to know a thing, you have to become it, right? And again, yes. if we see that on a purely practical level, flesh and bone, that's very hard to formulate just from that level you have to be able to also say there are other levels to view that from and from another level that's an acceptable and dare we say essential part of everybody's path not in a single lifetime this doesn't make sense and if it was if we all live for a hundred years and you're and it's good and evil then it's very simple you just kill those people straight away throw them in the pit off they go Mm -hmm. bye-bye don't do that Mm -hmm. you don't do that by and that's called conservatism with a capital c in a way it's yeah. a very way of doing things that because it um it admits an error up front which is there is ultimate good and evil which is absolutely not the case so that soul goes on its journey explores destruction and thinks that's a shit way of doing things that is it doesn't really serve me very well and in fact it derives from my own pain and my own weakness in life. And as everybody who's been exposed to that knows, those people are in pain. It doesn't uh, excuse what they're doing for a minute, but it begins to explain it. And then that guy comes in his next life and thinks, what can I do to counter the arising of the pain that used to cause me to behave violently? What can I do to counter that, to mitigate it, and, f- and f- fundamentally to understand it so it doesn't need to happen? So it all to something good as you might say or something constructive something enlightening and as that person moves through their cycle of incarnations they get better better smoother more elegant in how their consciousness works so you have to be you have to appreciate that there are situations where you need to pull someone out of a situation temporarily right and even if that person gets pulled out and starts doing it again, you might be able to create a situation where someone else doesn't have to experience it in, in quite so much of a coarse, crude manner, i.e. they're not getting beat up every day. If it was to my family, I would just get that guy and make sure that he never stepped through that door again. It would be hard not to do that, quite frankly. But I also appreciate that he, this mythical figure, is on a creative, sacred journey. And although he mm. can't... St- now, and maybe lots of people who have got carried away with an emotional response, which is perfectly acceptable, perfectly understandable, maybe they can't see it either. And they're thinking, why doesn't Kramer hate that man? I can't hate anybody because I've seen something that is trans- that moves outside of life and moves outside of homo sapien consciousness and carbon consciousness. I have made it my business, for whatever reason, to look further than that and as deeply into the heart of it at the same time as I possibly can and I've come away with the conclusion that the most primary force is a creation and destruction in a polarity world and that's what we're in and so anybody who is doing that stuff is mapping negative polarity temporarily and you don't on the negative and move to the positive and then you're done you ping back and two until you find this point uh, your exit from the solar system, from this realm, from this life, is when you find the center point. And depend, depending on how clever you are and how awakened you allow yourself to be, you will find that quicker than other people. So you don't have to dive into being Adolf Hitler and you don't have to live like Gandhi either. You don't, that's mm-hmm. not, you can say, well, they're extremes in a way. Mother Teresa is an extreme that doesn't actually serve her growth incredibly well, I would say. Not a very popular view, that. Um, 
And, and certainly we could say, well, you know, Pol Pot, his doesn't serve his growth in an amazingly brilliant, elegant manner. Not at all. But wouldn't it be interesting, once they die and come out of this realm, to sit with them in the Celestial Departure Lounge and say, you know, what was that shit you were just doing down there? That was... <laughs> and they go, yeah, I know. I don't quite know why I did that. I just felt... I just went completely off the page. Won't be doing that again. And you're like, I know. That is unbelievable what you just did. And fundamentally, as soon as you get out of here, the copy book is wiped clean. You know, all the ticks and crosses are erased. They only mean anything here in our moral code. But actually... Everybody gets there in the end, in my view. Everybody. Now, yeah. one final point on that. It is complicated, this issue, sometimes by the fact that not everybody is human who is here. Not everybody is ensouled mm. quite the same way as everybody else. But I would, yes. immediately on the heels of that, say, even so, every sentient life form, whether it is a natural-born human being from the creative divine center or not, whether it's a bloody visiting Andromedan or a thought form tulpa or Mm. some alchemical, bizarre, you know, gnome thing that's wandering about, whatever it is, everyone ultimately is in the same boat. As soon as you attain consciousness, you're in the same boat. And you might end up just dissolving and going back into the big recycling bin of the universe and not really carrying that particular trajectory on. Or you might have a very well-defined trajectory that you're in charge of because you have the gift and privilege of a soul that you have built and constructed and accepted and claimed. But even so, everybody, let's say, gets there in the end. So I don't really accept good and evil as any sort of meaningful forces in the universe. I see creation and destruction, though, and they serve the same moral and ethical purpose for me, that if I see someone where I choose to deem it unacceptable, the destruction that they are wreaking in their life, I will intervene. I will take it upon myself. Who gives you the right to do that? I do. I take it upon myself to intervene when... Gladly, very rarely, I see that happening. I will intervene. But I also appreciate the other dynamics to this as well. So I have my consciousness in two places at the same time. And that's fundamentally, that is the journey of the mystic, to try and make that happen more and more readily. Well, we don't have to collude with it, but we can have the bigger picture, as as you've said. And uh, I appreciate your words very much. For the listener, we are going to pause for 45 seconds of music and then return to the symposium. This is Sibel again. There are a lot of bad things going on in the world. There's a phase where you become aware of the bad things and you go into it deeper and there's this impression that witnessing it and being aware of it has some kind of positive effect versus keeping your head in the sand. Does it have a positive effect, being aware of what's going on? The more we are aware of the world and its dynamics and our relationship with it, the less we are unconsciously swayed by it the more awareness we accrue the more inner power we attain through our own awakening and our own humble enlightenment the more that helps us to decide things for ourselves what is creative what is destructive what is real what is unreal and in that manner the more aware you are of the dynamics of how this works the more you contribute to its resolution so i feel through what I've discovered and learned in the best way that I can, that the universe is an unfinished business and it is continually evolving itself. And so not only does it afford us the framework to do the same thing, to grow and learn and be better people and better entities and better souls or whatever, 
But we also play a part, quite a crucial part, in its evolution. So the answer is, is yes. If you understand what destruction is and what's a, a way to explore negativity than to actually destroy things, and what's a better way to safely go into that space and do something about it, then everything that you learn gets continually uploaded into the universal hard drive. Whether you open your mouth about it and do interviews and interview people and write blogs and do podcasts and whether you, whether you broadcast your knowledge or not makes absolutely no difference, none at all. All that matters is that you know it. And when you know a thing, it gets uploaded into the universal you know, hard drive, into the Akashic field, as, as we rather poetically like to say. And there it is for everybody to learn from. So if, on the other hand, you look at the news and think, look at all these terrible things happening in the world. And every time we make this observation, there's always a list we can rhyme off. And every, every day, if I click on a little feed in my web browser, it pops the headlines down and <laughs> they're, all, they're all awful every single day. Yeah, yeah. You have to be careful that, to balance that out for yourself. You, you cannot trust CNN and BBC to give you a balanced view. You have to attain that balance for yourself. But there's certainly lots of horrid things happening all the time and lots of people getting slaughtered every day, all over the world, every second of the day. If you turn away from that, all you're doing is postponing the day that you need to address it. So you can spend your whole life playing on your Xbox and reading um, lovely poems by uh, your favorite Victorian 18th century poets and just do that. And there's nothing wrong with that. But you are postponing matters. You are saying, look, I don't want to do that shit now. It's too hard. It's too horrible. It's ugly. I don't like it. And I don't feel equipped to do it. So instead, I'm going to uh, just do happy things in my little happy bubble, right? There's nothing wrong with that. But from my point of view, if somebody said that to me, do I think that's okay? I say, well, it is okay fundamentally. But a better thing to do, a better move, is while you're here, and while you have afforded yourself the opportunity to learn in this world of polarity, this is a classic exercise in dealing with shadow, in dealing with the shadow of the world and of yourself, and understanding the relationship between the two, because there's no doubt about it. To get out of here, you have to know it. You have to map it fully, like with this you know, mystical cartographer, off we go with our pen and paper, and we make thorough notes about the dynamics and the layout and the terrain to the best of our ability. And so one day you sit back and think, yeah, I think that dynamic is pretty universal. And then you get together with other people and they agree. And then you, the people who disagree, they, you, know, you look at that and frown for a minute, but then you realize that they've got something important that you'd missed, that you'd uh, overlooked by accident. And so you take that in as well. You take that into account. And off you go on these, on these lifetimes until you reach a point where you say, it is incredibly beautiful, this polarity, how it works. It's just like a divine interplay, an orchestra, all these things when all the different instruments, the violins and the cellos and the timpani, all these things all come together in this huge interference pattern that we call music. In the same way, the interference pattern of polarity, of negative and positive energetic emanations, create this interference pattern how silly would it be therefore to ignore the negative bit of that pattern you'd be missing out on half the creation you'd be missing out on 50 percent of life yeah so what we do is we address it so we can reframe what it is and realize that destruction is as uh, relevant in life as creation is sometimes things have to be taken down in order to make new things and some things have to go away so new things can arise, period, for balance. So here, for the moment, and let's remember this is temporary, this is a stage in our conscious evolution, for the moment there is this theatre, this absolutely unreal theatre, this dramatic stage play where there's this positive, huge plus sign on one side of the stage, and on the other side of the stage this enormous minus negative sign and all the action takes place on that stage and that's the way it is and when you've fully understood it and played all the roles and you've sat back as the director 
and considered the message of those roles and what it makes people feel like, then you can leave that theatre and you don't need to return to it again and you go on to other places where there is no polarity. Okay, because it's, I look at drones are killing children and women are getting raped in India and there feels like that's not something I can personally change, but my witnessing it and going authentically, that's not okay with me. Yeah, it's means not, something. It does, and it, and it that's again important always to bring it down to the real level. And as you say, at, at the time of this recording, which is uh, January 2013, for all the future time traveling listeners. Um, yeah, there's people being raped and murdered and cut up and tortured and all, all sorts of things all over the world right now, right there in the news. There's a number of things you can do. You can go out there and uh, get a few thousand dollars together and go and volunteer and work at a center that um, takes people in and rehabilitates offenders and cares for so-called uh, abused victims or whatever. And you can physically go and do something if you want to. That's great that we have people like that. I would be in a real mess. You can also do something else, which is just turn off that news and not never look at it, which hopefully we have uh, seen is not a wise move. You can also obsess over that stuff and watch it all the time and just always watch this bleak, horrid tale of human depravity and just think, what, what, what's the point? We're just fucked. It's all a, a complete yeah. disaster. We're awful. You could get stuck in, in you know, doom porn. Doom porn, exactly. Or you can do another thing, which is say, right, why do people do that? And if you can get some sort of answers for yourself on that, A, it will make you understand what's going on, and B, you directly contribute at a very profound, pragmatic, physical, mechanical level to the resolution of those problems. If you understand why somebody behaves in a destructive manner from pain, if you can understand that within the dynamics of your own life, you contribute to the diminishment of that globally. And if you doubt that for a minute, or not you personally, but if anybody doubts that for a minute, you need to go away and do your homework on this. Because that only doesn't make sense when you imagine that we're all separate. If you think we're all just these completely separated little animals wandering about being either nice or unpleasant to each other, then that's, it's all unfathomable and horrid. But if you get to the knowing, which is very easy to do if you think in the right manner and allow things to occur in your brain, you start to get the idea, this oneness, actually we're all this same organism in a sense, we're all part of each other. So it doesn't really make sense to hurt one another because we're just hurting ourselves. Equally, if one part of that organism starts to illuminate itself, it affects all those within the resonance of that illumination. Anybody who is a little bit like you, anywhere in the world, will start to change. Anybody. Okay. And that beacon of consciousness, you have to realize that that isn't just in your house, in your living room, on your screen, in your bed, in your dreams, in your shower. That consciousness that you're having in your mind is the same one that that murdered lady had or that abusive man had. It's, all, it's the same one. So you are affecting their mind when you change your mind. And the knock-on snowball effect of that is that you quicken the resolution of negative destructive behavior the more you personally understand it as it relates to your life. So it isn't necessary to keep up with the evil of the world because the principle of it is the same today as it was 50,000 years ago. It's not changed. The expression of it changes. So rather than an axe coming down and cleaving somebody's skull open, it's now a little plane that flies over and drops a bomb on them, right? But the principle of it, the root of it is exactly the same. And if you do your bit as you, your unique vision of this, to understand it, you directly contribute to the resolution and the point of balance where that negative mapping is no longer necessary because it's been fully mapped. And you were one of the people who contribute to that full mapping. Okay. Because I, I guess there's a part of me that almost feels guilty for 
for focusing instead on you know the, the the bad things, but trying to magnify the good things by focusing on them, and the new discoveries and and the the connections. I mean, the amount of information flying around the internet's just brilliant, and to just dive into that brilliance instead. Well, that's your choice, isn't it? You can dive into awfulness or brilliance to your heart's content and you can swim in the thick swamp of disgraceful human conduct for your every single day of your whole life if you want to or you can you know float around in the luscious pools of wonderfulness every single day of your life if you want to as well no reason why not Mm -hmm. isn't it better to say well I'm going to experience a balance of these things and I'm going to understand the principles of them. And I'm going to go with a certain flow on this. So sometimes it's going to be relevant to address shadow and see why it expresses itself in that way. But rather than just pouring over the disgraceful reporting that MSNBC and CNN and Fox and all those guys, rather than using that as my information source, which is incredibly unreliable, the best thing you can do is see the exact same pattern in your own life, community, in your own family, in your own relationships, in your own self, in your own wounding and your own neuroses and depressions and pain because you have them. I have them. We all do. If you begin to unravel that in you, you directly influence all those people thousands of miles away you, you will never see. So the most graceful generous thing you can do is work on that very same negative patterning in yourself and then it's a choice as to how you decide to have that bolstered by any sort of media consumption at all you may decide that's no longer relevant because the work you are doing in shadow is right at the very core of it and you don't any longer need to put yourself in a position where you need to read about that on screens and the endless iterations of it around the planet, no longer relevant to you because you are dealing right at the core of that destruction. You know, you can, we can imagine how horrible things can be endlessly. And we can read about them to remind ourselves of that. But once you're actually dealing with it, would you need to do that every day? Would you need to give penance to that and revere that horribleness? Or is it better to work on the resolution in yourself? Yeah. Yeah, and that that just feels a lot yummier anyway. It feels yummier because it's balance. Yeah. Denying it, and you're not somehow obtaining a, a, a bizarre cross of guilt that you have to then bear the weight of somehow is something wonderful to do. You don't get any points for martyrdom on this game. There are no points for martyrdom, none at all, right? <laughs> to yourself you feel free baby and go for it and i don't mean personally you sound excellent but that impulse in us that you're talking about that some people do some people think it's so wonderful to martyr themselves but all it does is slow down growth slow down progress slow down the resolution slow down the point of balance it keeps it further and further and further away and the news people know that and they continually polarize to move us away from balance. So we have to reject that. Not what they're talking about, but we have to take our own view on that and we have to control our consumption of that stuff so you can actually do something about it. Yeah, I agree very much. So my next question is, it feels like post-2012, the energies have changed. And I spoke with someone who said that there was an acceleration, a pressure going on before 2012 and during 2012 and now that's dropped off and people who did a lot of work, they're feeling less pressure. But people who avoided doing the work may be in breakdown as old patterns aren't as successful now. What are you seeing post-2012? I'm seeing a lot of people not know what the hell they're doing anymore, which is just hilarious. I'm sorry. <laughs> and I could, it's, it was so obvious this such a long time ago. I feel slightly guilty laughing about it, but... It's, it, again, that's a, a, an excellent question, as, as indeed all of them have been. For me, okay, 2012's come and gone, and one might say, right, on a very practical level, nothing happened. Mm-hmm. And if you're super in tune with the Andromedan rays and the blue people from Venus or whatever, you might have felt a tremendous, wonderful, awesome, 
earth-shattering orgasmic shift in your pranic emanations or whatever. Fantastic. I feel so happy for you. That's great. You know, that sounds like a wonderful thing. No, no shit, right? And I'll make it a, a joke about it. Well, that's great. But actually, the same dynamics that were at play in the year 2001 are still at play in 2013. And this, to me, points to the principle of, of self-determination and motivation, right? And many people need something to look forward to or some object of worship or even some sort of deadline, some adversary, in a way, to rail against. And they need some external transcendental force to believe in, something to, to go up to. And they might argue, no, I don't need that. I don't need motivating. I don't need a special dimensional shift day. But they do. They do, really. And if they put the hand on the hearts and say, look, if you say the wrong answer, you will be eternally damned. What's the answer? They say, yeah, I, uh, I, do. I do need something to look forward to in the future, really, that's outside of myself. And if they need that system, if they need that way of doing things, I think that's, that's bizarre. I think that's a funny thing. What's a, a better way to look at it is to say that if somebody wants, you know, if somebody wants to believe that Jehovah or Joseph Smith or Jesus or Krishna or Buddha or, or whoever has all the answers and that's it, they've covered the whole thing and they've formulated the ultimate path of spiritual ascendance, then fine. That's okay. See how far you get with that? You, you, you could go a long way. You could go a long way with that if you're super smart, but you will reach a point where you encounter the boundary of that system, you'll come to its terminus and you must then decide if you deem it appropriate, if you think it's okay to move beyond that on your own. And I think that ultimately the human soul has to do it their own way. And at times like this, we have to be careful not to replace one redeemer, savior, figure or event with another more modern one. Is it that different to do away with Christ as the whole answer and replace him with the blue people from Venus? Is that so very different or is it just a sort of sexy modern rehash of an old pattern that really just serves to move us away from our sovereign power? So I think that a lot of people have been bumped, as they say, in the military and security services by um, the opponent here. I've said, look, you have reached a point now where you can no longer put this off as to some special date and you can no longer use that date as the sort of pivot of your ascendance. In fact, you have to do away with that date. You have to do away with the energies that rise and fall, just like tides rise and fall. Yes, they do rise and fall and sometimes it's good to do stuff energetically at certain points in time and sometimes it's unwise when that ebbs right so there's nothing wrong with observing that and certainly there are people who are sensitive to the energetic flow but so what you know so what if there is a big massive shift and things some amazing things happen and the motherships land and the volcanoes all go off and millions of people die so what you've still got the same dynamics that you go forward with and so the universe isn't suddenly going to pull the rug out from everyone's feet and say, you know all that hard work you've been doing for like 12,000 years in your current soul trajectory? Yeah, you don't need to bother with that anymore because this thing's happened and we're all, we're all equal now and we're all at exactly the same place and all your coursework has been irrelevant really. Sorry about that. But um, anyway, hey, we're all, we're all transcending now into the, the fifth dimension, so that's good, isn't it? <laughs> It's not going to do that because everybody's journey is hard won and is unique and has you know extraordinary value and has this uh, superb sort of singular articulation that the universe needs. It needs everybody's unique individual perspective. And so for the people who have been feeling pressured to grow, yeah, don't, don't feel pressured to grow. If you feel pressured to go asleep, you won't sleep. If you don't feel pressure to go to sleep, you will sleep, right? Just as we've said two or three times in this conversation, great little image for it. And for those people who, as you say, have avoided doing work and they're just thinking, well, you know, what's the point? 2013's come and gone and 2012 rather, 2012's come and gone. You know, why? who cares? You know, the Obama administration is starting to look 
a little bit like the Bush administration. Can that possibly be? Is that is that okay to say that? Is you know where the hell are we? You know Europe's collapsing, the dollar's you know disappearing up its own bottom, and you know there's all these like stupid things that are happening, and none of that's got any better. But I think that as you approach the center point, you become very, very, very aware of the positive and the negative more in harmony with each other, as you were saying earlier. There's so many incredible things going on on the planet that it, it, you, you can't possibly keep up with them all. You know, people come to me and say, oh, have you heard about this guy? He's doing this thing with sound waves and this from that and blah. And I'm like, wow, it's incredible. I'm like, right, I'll add that to the list of 99 other projects that I'm currently investigating and looking at and trying to understand, which are all equally exciting. It's impossible to keep up with the awesomeness of what we're doing in the same way it's impossible to keep up with the depravity of what we're doing and the wrongness of what we're doing. And I think that's a marker when it's at a point of you know optimal dynamism, even though that might sound like a a funny word to use when things are really bad, still, you know, that energy is fizzing like water boiling in a pan where you think, well, it doesn't get any more boiling than this. And that means that a certain alchemy is being achieved now. We've reached the boiling point now. It's not going to boil any more than it is doing. But that shows, that's a conscious marker that in a manner of speaking globally, you're reaching a threshold where our awareness of it has reached a certain peak. So there's not an awful lot more evil to be aware of, right? We kind of get that now. So I think that that mapping has come to an end and we're starting now to put the resolutions forth. And even the the most dim-witted man in the street is starting to realize that politics is a complete waste of time. And that war is a complete waste of time. And you you have to sort of really go to very, very, very unconscious people to get the opposite side of that. But the the average person who has a little bit of space and time to think and a a few resources to sit back and ponder for a moment realizes that we need to do things in a different way. And for spiritual people, we're obsessed with having prophecies and magical dates and incredible cosmic interventions that mark this movement of energy. And it's totally unnecessary. It's just a thirst for drama, that. It's a fetish for the theatrical. And lots and lots of what I call Kmart prophets right, go out there and pretend that they know what's going on. Right? They pretend that they somehow whether it's being given to them by some extraterrestrial beings or some ultra-terrestrial entities or some hidden masters or some very wise people who live beneath the earth or whatever. And I'm slightly making fun of that just for comic purposes. But when it's an incredible claim, and there's lots and lots of people doing this, what they're suggesting is that they have somehow found the narrative that fits what's going on in the world right now. And I'll tell you a secret, right? There isn't a world narrative. So our desire to make sense of it, I think, well, this is what's going on. Oh, okay, right. Now I finally understand what, right, brilliant. I understand it now. Now we can just relax and, you know, understand what's coming around the corner. There isn't a world narrative. So the idea of somebody supposing that they have it and say, look, there's this great celestial war going on and the Pleiadians and Arcturians and the Anunnaki are coming, and there's these secret people doing these things, and the old elven powers are right. That's very nice, and that's okay to some extent to articulate some pieces of the puzzle. But for one human being to imagine that they have been gifted the narrative of what's going on is silly. It's just silly. So anybody who is putting forth that, be very wary of that. Be very wary of that person who assumes that it's okay for them to put forward a narrative that applies not only to them, which would be completely fine if they want to think that, but actually to everybody else as well. Anyone who's doing that, I would suggest that you be very wary of that person. The narrative of the universe, there isn't one. 
It's an unfinished business and the rules change day by day by day. What we can say is that it gradually refines itself and becomes more attuned and more balanced and it goes forward with a certain beauty and a certain artistry dependent on every node in that system becoming aware of itself and its surroundings. So as you go through that, you swap the idea of the master plan and the big story and the architecture and the physics of it. You throw that out and say, look, there's no physics to this art as such. There's, there's ways of describing it through physics, but there's no master plan. There's no narrative that we need to worry about. We each have a personal reality tunnel. And as we superimpose those over each other, we have a certain consensus. And when a critical mass is reached of a truer number of real organic reality tunnels, where there's a point of great balance, that tips the whole consensus reality tunnel to say this is a better way of doing things and everybody starts to go with it. It's just a vibration right there in the center of us. And all, all you need to do is do that in your own reality tunnel. And you have high conduct, you be honorable, you live nobly, you know, you're not going to stand on anybody, you're not going to disregard anybody, there's no need to be rude to anybody, there's very rarely the need to take up arms, and if you do, you're just mapping polarity again, you know, you're losing that center point. But you understand that by resolving the micro situation of your own reality tunnel, the, the principles at play there of creation and destruction, the most primal things that make good and evil look stupid. If you resolve those creative and destructive principles in your own life and achieve a balance point, you're also doing it on the macro level for everybody else as well. So that's what we're about here. And the fact that a calendar begins and ends, or the 13th Bacton comes around, or we get contact with alien, those are no sort of markers, no meaningful markers. It doesn't matter about those things. And something dug up underneath a pyramid. You know, it's, it's exciting and interesting, but it doesn't constitute some sort of point of ultimate catapult into the future. It's just another thing, another thing. What really matters is what you do in your own life, in your own house, in your own community, in your own thinking. And that perception is absolutely intrinsically enmeshed into every other single perception in the solar system. So once you get that, and once you start to really feel that in your bones, there's a great responsibility to be as awakened and as vigilant and as excellent as you can be. And that is the game for me. That's wonderful. <laughs> It takes me back to the, the image of the river, and I think I've spent so much time wanting to know, where does the river go? What's going to happen with the river? And now this next stage in my development is not needing to know and just being on the river. Yeah. And, and that, it's that a becomes... totally different experience. Yes, it is. And it becomes more interesting when you do that, not just because you don't know, not just because you've lost the desire to place what's going on or to position your consciousness within it. But you say, well, there's a reason why the wisest people on earth, when asked how does it all work, always say, well, that's essentially a mystery. <laughs> there's a reason they say that. They're not just saying, I don't know. They're saying something more than that. And they're not just saying, well, who cares? They're saying something more than that. The mystery of the universe is something that can only be observed as you approach as you approach it personally. And so if you look at something like Lao Tzu in the Tao Te Ching, that's the sort of book you read that when you're 20, you think, what a lot of crap that is. And then when you're 40, you come back and think, this is pretty good, actually. And then when you're 60, you come back and think, this is great. This is really, really, really good. Because you've begun to appreciate how somebody wisely and respectfully begins to articulate that which cannot be articulated, but you can start to show the outline of it, and you can, and you can respectfully say, look, everybody's welcome to answer those questions, but if you're grabbing at knowledge, and if you're pursuing answers, you're going to miss what's right in front of your face. The most adventurous, brilliant thing is right in front of your face. And you've got to create the space 
mentally and psychically and emotionally to see that and to allow it to happen, which is all very much a matter of purification, to throw out rubbish, throw out bad concepts, get those old wounds healed. Don't carry them around like bloody martyr. Get them healed, right? And if you can't do it, find someone who can facilitate the space that you can do it. And then once you get that state of purity, which is never absolute while you're a human being, goodness knows there's all kinds of weird things happening that challenge that every day, but there's a certain basic mental psychic hygienic state where you can say now I am in a position now I have created the environment mentally that I can actually see reality as it actually is and start to rewire it and start to improve it because that's what we've been asked to do you go in there guys have a piece of divinity off you go and do something excellent don't do anything (laughs) shit do something excellent off you go and the more purity you attain the biggest say you have in what goes on here so if you watch the news and are just horrified by it be aware of what's going on choose when to turn it off but more importantly do something about it do it in your own life that's where it really resonates ah thank you and chipper has a poem for you okay let me just read this cartographings of a soul Linguinaire extraordinaire, mystics integrating Brahmarandra's cave onto the streets, facing the houses where they shave in the morning as they sit down within and become brave. To set out on this journey as our world we start to save, vectoring a consciousness this time around and as a Dave on this canvas swirled in multiple synchronized octaves. We will name the ways our steps fall as they tiptoe into days. We will have a lunch or two inviting to be tasted and to munch, writing staff marks on the cleft we choose to sound out inner depths, flavored by the tongue that listens symphonically to flow, rhyme to fluctuations in the edge as far as an oncoming, incoming wave. We talk into the center without needing to be brave, loved in spite of what we dink about when ego claims it saves. Namaste. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. On behalf of Sky Blue Symposia, we would like to thank Neil for his compassion and brilliance. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. You can find out more about Neil and his work on his website at neilkramer.com. 